It was established in 1970. Uh, otherwise, I want to thank uh, the distinguished, uh, the moderator, distinguished panelists, the keynote speaker for joining us this morning. And uh, all protocols are observed. And uh, with that, I um, have great pleasure to invite Professor Mike Kuria, uh, the Acting Executive Secretary of Inter University Council to give his welcome remarks and subsequently uh, invite the moderator, Professor Kibuga, to take us through the whole webinar uh, session. Professor Mike Kuria, Karibu Sana. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Koson. Um, our keynote speaker, Ambassador Clark, our distinguished panelist, uh, Vice Chancellor Makere University, uh, Professor Banas Nawangwe, although I have not yet uh, seen him, uh, Vice Chancellor, University of Nairobi, Professor Kema, Vice Chancellor, Pan Africa Christian University, Professor Margaret Muthui, Deputy Vice Chancellor, University of Dar es Salaam, Bonaventure, Sevad Esangoma Rutinua, uh, our very own immediate former Executive Secretary, Professor Alexandra Liababaje, Professor Koye, our moderator, members of the Executive Board. I have noticed a number of you. Um, <clears throat> Bravel students who are here, development partners, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, allow me to use this opportunity to extend a very warm welcome to every one of you and to thank you very much uh, for joining us for this uh, third webinar series. We are glad that uh, Charles Clark could join us all the way from the UK. Um, I do remember those days when he was uh, in the cabinet. I was a student in the UK at that time. And I remember the robust debates that used to take place between the Prime Minister and William Hague. And I know this is the time that he served. I, I'm also very delighted to see that the Vice Chancellors of the various universities are here. Uh, Makere University, University of Nairobi and the University of Dar es Salaam. And uh, to share with us the experience of, and vision of higher education in the region. But of course you're aware that when those universities came into existence, there were no private universities. And therefore we are very delighted also to have uh, Professor Margaret Muthui representing public universities. Um, just for purposes of some people who may be here and may be not too much aware about the Inter-University Council for East Africa, allow me to just say a few things about the, uh, the, the council. Uh, we are now celebrating 50 years. That's one of the reasons why we are here. Uh, and this is because uh, the Inter-University Council for East Africa came to, into existence in 1970. That is when the three uh, universities, first universities of Makere, Nairobi, and University of Dar es Salaam were formed after the dissolution of the uh, University of East Africa. Um, and then when the, in, the East African community was formed in 1967, you know that it lasted up to 1977. But uh, in 1977, it collapsed. However, the committee that had been formed by members of the three universities to coordinate higher education in the region, they used to call it Inter-University Committee, it survived. And so, and in 1980, the vice chancellors of the three universities decided to transform the Inter-University Committee. They, they signed an MOU that transformed the Inter-University Committee into the Inter-University Council for East Africa. Then in 1999, under the treaty establishing the East African community, the Inter-University uh, Council for East Africa was recognized as a surviving institution of the East African community. In 2002, a protocol was signed. Um, and this, in this protocol, it is called the Protocol and Headquarters Agreement. This established uh, IUCA as a body corporate in Uganda. And then in 2009, the East African Legislative Assembly passed an act. And that act established IUCA as an institution of the East African community. That act gives the Inter-University uh, Council for East Africa two main functions. One of them is to advise partner states on all matters higher education. And the second one, is to coordinate higher education in the region. Ladies and gentlemen, I must emphasize that whenever I say Inter-University Council for East Africa, 
I do not mean us here as staff members at the Secretariat. The Inter-University Council for East Africa, the membership is defined very clearly in that act, which is passed by the East African Legislative Assembly. It includes all universities, colleges, and degree awarding institutions in the East African community. All those have a, a chance or opportunity to become members of the Inter-University Council for East Africa, and currently about 130 of them are members. And so when I talk about the Inter-University Council for East Africa, that is who I am referring to. So ladies and gentlemen, in trying to uh, implement that mandate given to us by the East African community, we are usually guided by five year strategic plans. And the current one runs from um, 2016 to 2021. It means it will end next year, uh, 2021. And we are trying to use these celebrations also to think about how we can develop strategic, uh, the next strategic plan and even think beyond that strategic plan. This is the reason why we are here. And so I'm looking forward to the discussion that are going to take place uh, during this time. But before I go, before I invite the moderator of this meeting, I want to leave you with two images that I find interesting uh, in this discussion. And uh, one of them is uh, an image of a young boy that I saw on social media. It was supposed to be a joke, but I think that joke is very serious. Uh, this young boy is looking into his mobile phone, and then he's looking at his teachers and laughing his head off. And then he says, the teacher said no mobile in school. Now the school is in the mobile phone. That's the first image I want to leave with you. The second image I want to leave you is something that I experienced not long ago. I was driving home, not far away from here, and I felt like eating roast maize. You know, roast maize is always sold at the side of the road. So I stopped by the side of the road, and I found this young lady with three girls. She was roasting the maize. And so I started chatting the young girls, and I asked them, are you going to school? They said, no. Then I asked them, are you studying on the phone? They kept quiet, but the mother pulled out her phone from her bag and showed it to me. And with sadness in her eyes, she said, can they really study in this kind of a phone? The phone she was holding was not a smartphone. It did not have a smart screen. And therefore, this, these kids cannot study from that particular phone. So I asked them, how are you studying? And they told me, we have pullouts from newspapers. Ladies and gentlemen, I, re I, I raised these two images because we are living in an, in an environment where we say we are now in the fourth industrial revolution. We hear that many times, and it is great. We are also talking about the SDGs, and we are talking about quality and access of higher education. But we have these two extremes also in the region. And I can't help asking myself, in this context, how should universities uh, behave? How should they teach? How should they plan? What should they focus on? These are some issues that uh, come to my mind. And therefore, in this context, I want to invite you, ladies and gentlemen, to share your transformative ideas in which we can transform and take care of higher education in the region in spite of these diversities that we can see. And with these few remarks, ladies and gentlemen, I take this opportunity to invite the moderator of the meeting, Professor Koitarima. Uh, please, you're welcome. Good morning, all. It is great to see everyone who is even active on the chat. I'm seeing greetings from Islamic University, Daystar, Mbarara, um, and so on, Africa Rural University. It's great to see you all here. Um, and we look forward to a very robust conversation. I've already seen some questions being raised on the chat room. So please continue to um, raise questions or comments on the chat room. I'll do my best to pick uh, as many as possible and channel them to the right uh, panelists and to our uh, keynote speaker. Um, I hope you've had a chance to look through some of the work that um, Professor Charles Clark, who says I should call him Charles, so uh, um, that our keynote speaker has um, been involved with and some of the articles and the things that he's done. He's been a key involver um, in higher education in the British space, in the East African space, but his comments and sentiments and his work has influenced 
what the British Council has done, what DFID has done in engaging with a lot of our institutions. So I'd like to make a, a very warm welcome to uh, Charles. I do not want to take any of your thunder away, but we are very eager to hear about what you think um, the trends are that we need to pay attention to as we look towards the next 50 years as an inter-university council, but also individually as we running and working at different institutions, how do we position ourselves in order to not only bring Africa from the precipice of greatness, but into greatness, um, and also be able to launch our youth, our economy in the right direction that gives us autonomy and independence, but also keeps us uh, a part of the global community. So I know uh, that's a mouthful, but um, uh, from reading your articles and having a preview of your presentation, um, we are in the right place with the right person to start this conversation. So Buona Charles, Karibu um, Sana, and welcome. And we look forward to learning from you. Um, panelists, we also want to, I also want to recognize all the panelists, the vice chancellors who are here, as well as um, our dir directors, I think of um, IUCEA, we have several representatives of regulators across the uh, East African community. And um, also a lot of uh, prominent educators. So I'd like to welcome you, uh, Buona Charles, and also panelists, please keep your comments coming. Thank you, and Karibu. Koi, thank you very much for that very, very warm welcome, which I very much appreciate. I hope you won't mind me calling you Koi. I don't know what the uh, form and the, the uh, customs are, but uh, if we can say on first name terms, that would be tremendous. And thank you to Mike for the uh, Mike Curia for the invitation to participate in this event. It's really a tremendous honour for me to be asked to come in, uh, to come here, and uh, I appreciate it greatly. Uh, particularly in these extraordinary times with COVID, to have an event of this type is really extraordinary. Um, I was asked to talk about the title "Reshaping Higher Education in East Africa: Global Trends and Reflections from the EAC's Agenda 2050." And that's what I'm going to do. Next slide, please. Perfect. Um, and the first point I want to make is the East African Community Vision 2050, which was launched five years ago in Arusha. It was also closely uh, harmonized with the African Union Agenda 2063, called uh, A Transformed Continent, uh, which was uh, launched earlier that year. So we're speaking uh, in a very well-aligned situation. Uh, next slide, please. And the alignments of both the African Union and the East African uh, community had a set of ambitions for those periods well in advance. A prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development, an integrated and politically united continent, an Africa of good governance, democracy, respect for human rights, justice and the rule of law, a peaceful and secure Africa, an Africa with a strong cultural identity, uh, common heritage, shared value and ethics, uh, an Africa whose development is people driven, relying on the potential of African people, particularly its women and youth and caring for children, and Africa uh, as a strong, united and influential global player and partner. These are an inspiring set of ambitions uh, that we are really talking about. But it's a long way ahead. 2050 is 30 years ahead. And it's not as though we're standing still and trying to make progress for Africa and nothing's happening in the world around us. In those 30 years, there is enormous change for us to deal with. The international competition between countries, companies uh, will intensify. Mike has already referred to the fourth industrial revolution with the new technologies, artificial intelligence, new forms of work. We're seeing some aspects of that already demonstrated by the way in which we're working today in the COVID conditions. Cultural identities changing very strongly and very substantially. And uh, the potential of women and young people needing to be recognized by changing our societies so that the whole of the society, diverse as it is, can contribute to the future in a good way. And very important in all of this, good governance of our societies and communities 
so that we're able to uh, deal with the uh, situations and challenges that we face. My argument, Coy, is the key element, the key central element for making this enormously ambitious change happen is high quality universities. They're central to everything. I think they're more important than any other institutions, including even governments, multinational corporations, and so on. And I hope to explain why in this presentation and to suggest ways in which universities can meet up to that challenge. Why do I think high quality universities are so important? Firstly, they engage a wide range of people across each of our countries, identifying with young people. Secondly, they engage with the economy. The economy can't work in whatever form of activity you're talking about uh, without good relations with the universities, high quality people in all aspects of the economy, particularly in this changing situation that I've just described. Many of the people who work in the economy will have had some form of university education, which will be important to them to be able to contribute to their businesses and their organizations in a wide variety of different ways. And that's true too of public services. Public services uh, will only be high quality if they are involving high quality universities and the high quality people who've been trained by the universities. In countries like yours and also in mine, it is the universities who are training the people working in health, the universities training the people working in schools and education, the universities training the people working in the knowledge economy. And in those public services, the quality of those public services will in turn depend on how well universities have been able to do their job and ensure that you have high quality people running those public services, making them work, making them go. And then the communities and the wider society, it's critically uh, important. Um, the, the, in a world where things are becoming more conflicted, more dif difficult, where change is more challenging, it's universities' ability to moderate the discussions in our communities, whether the great cities of the continent or the rural areas. How can universities help those conversations, those communities build and strengthen themselves? And most important of all, the values that the universities embody. Mike gave an interesting account a few moments ago of the history of the university communities in East Africa. And uh, he didn't put it quite like this, but they reflect the different circumstances of the countries as they evolved over this period in different ways. And they embed, you embed, a set of values, beliefs, characteristics, which need to be at the core of a strong, new and evolving society. And so the values of universities are so important. And then perhaps critically important, uh, rather difficult words to describe, energy and entrepreneurship. It is important that universities create people who are exciting, looking to the future, looking for new opportunities, looking for new possibilities, seeing how you bring together different talents in different ways. And that's that energy and entrepreneurship which needs to come from the universities. So the reason why I emphasize the importance of high quality universities to the whole ambition of the East African community and indeed the African Union more widely is that it's universities which can do all of those things which I've described. It's universities which meet those challenges, either well or badly. And that's the question we're going to come to in a second. But there aren't other organizations, private companies, corporations, even governments, which can themselves do all of those things. So universities are the core of that change. And I'm glad that's been recognized in the East African Community's Vision 2050. I hadn't, before preparing for this talk, uh, read the document fully, but Annex 3 of that Vision 2050 talks about exactly these things in the way I've been talking about. It was uh, in 2015 at Arusha when the document was launched, there was the vision and Annex 3, virtual university education. That's Mike's account when he's talking about the, uh, the phone and the computer and the whole way in which we, we operate in different ways now from we used to do. It talks that, uh, that Annex talks about teaching, moving the focus away from purely teaching towards learning so that 
you're not just talking about is a good teacher able to give a good lecture is a good teacher able to sum something up but can a good teacher help the student learn to what extent is the teaching really about helping learning rather than simply uh, pumping out the view that the teacher has and key to that lifelong learning it's not simply a front-loaded model where you say people go to university after school relatively early in their lives it actually extends throughout life because things are changing so fast so quickly that you can't simply say that what was learned some while ago still remains exactly the same in 30 years time because it won't do on the research that annex of the eac vision 2050 talked specifically and rightly about moving the focus to development and innovation in practical ways so research is not simply um, an isolated activity but something which is being used and should be used to help develop and strengthen the society and the economy to help innovate in a variety of different ways and always related to the practical and real circumstances in which people are living in which organizations exist it talks about shifting from community service, which is an important concept, the idea of giving to the community, which is important, to community engagement, i.e. how is the community working with the university, engaged with the university, um, cooperating with the university to make things for, go well. And the other way around, how well is the university engaging with what the community is about, what it's trying to do and how it's making it go. And it also talks that's Annex 3 of specialization and centers of excellence. So they're important aspects of the idea of the future university, which was encompassed, was set out very directly, very explicitly five years ago when the EAC Vision 2050 was launched. And it reflects the centrality, which Mike described uh, a second ago, of the universities in East Africa to the future success of East Africa. And that's where this uh, set of proposals uh, set out in that annex relate to the book which uh, I wrote with Ed Byrne, the principal of King's College London. It was called The University Challenge. And I'll do a short commercial here, Coy, if you don't mind, uh, and say it there. It can be uh, acquired from all good Amazon sellers. Um, we argue in the book that the universities facing up to these challenges of the future have four main uh, roles and what I intend to do in the rest of this presentation is to go through each of these roles uh, specifically and to hopefully throw out some thoughts for thinking about in terms of East Africa. Firstly their role is to understand and interpret the process of change of society. Uh, this change I described earlier on the next 30 years what's going to happen the fourth industrial revolution how societies are going to change what's the position of women and so on we have to understand and interpret what's going on, how it's going on. Who is thinking about that understanding and interpreting? Well, the answer is, again, the universities in trying to understand what's set happening. But secondly, once that's understood and interpreted, offering, offering approaches that would harness the process of change to the general benefit. So it's not just a private activity of a few professors sitting in a room and thinking what's going on. It's saying to the society, well, how can we deal with this so that we are the masters or mistresses of that process of change rather than simply the victims of that process of change? So if you look for the sake of argument at climate change, for the sake of argument, we can see these things happening. Are we simply victims of this process or are we able to change our societies, our behavior uh, and uh, move forward in a good way? And I think universities are central organizations to being able to do that to say well how do we address climate change or how do we address um, uh, the move of artificial intelligence that it comes through how do we address pandemics like this covid process we're going through at the moment how do we deal with that it's not just a question of understanding and interpreting the process of change it's a question of also offering approaches to harness the process of change to general benefit and then the third function educating and training to high quality the specialist workers whose skills are necessary to address this change the fact is change is only addressed by people by people saying well how do we deal with this change whether it's in public services whether it's in uh, innovation uh, and innovative business uh, whatever it might be 
and it is the universities who are educating and training the people throughout our society <laughs> whose skills are necessary to address the change. And it may seem obvious, but I'll say it nevertheless, that it's no good educating and training people to the standards of 50 years ago. You've got to educate and train people to what the future is going to be. And that's difficult. It's very hard. By the way, I don't think any of these uh, uh, things I'm talking about are at all easy. I don't think they're easy tasks. I don't think you can, the university can just say, okay, we'll do it. It's fine. These are all difficult. And that's true of the educating and training to high quality, the specialist workers we need. And then there's a fourth role, which I think in my own mind has gone up the agenda in recent years, which is creating a general intellectually engaging climate and culture across societies that promotes the virtues of understanding and science. It seems to me important that the classic values of universities, of understanding and science, of applying the scientific method, trying to understand what's going on, having a proposition, testing it, looking at it again, is particularly important in an area where some very senior politicians around the world seem to say that uh, science doesn't matter uh, and you talk, and talk about fake news in some kind of way uh, who denigrate experts sometimes. I would say that science and understanding the general intellectually engaging climate respect as a core element of it. This kind of society is a society which gives us the best possibilities of uh, addressing the challenges of the future. And the universities, uh, I would say, have a particular responsibility. So, Coy, what I'm going to do is take those four subjects and go slide by slide through a, a more substantial discussion of each of those moments. And the first of, the, of those is research, uh, understanding and interpreting. And what I suggested here for the context of this meeting, the East African community, is partly what Mike said earlier, the East African narrative of university contrib contribution to progress. It's important to be clear that as East Africa and your countries, particularly your six countries in the EAC, but also more widely, have developed uh, coming through away from colonialism and so on, universities have played an important role. They have made a contribution to progress. You need to assert that's true, to demonstrate how that's true, to gain support and understanding for the view that you have an important role to play. I'm certainly not an expert on the history of your university, certainly nothing like to the extent which all of you are. Uh, but I know very well that in some of the countries, the situation of the universities has been very difficult at certain moments of this history. And I think explaining that history is important. And why? Because I would say for your universities, it's ex extremely important to assert the African dimension in the world context. Why do I say that? The truth is there's an Anglo-American, Anglophone, Europe, European dominance in many ways of the understanding of the world of what is knowledge and how do we operate. That results from the end of the Second World War, World War II, through till very recently, where the ways of thinking that uh, have dominated uh, the way the world has worked has come from a relatively small geographically speaking part of the world and has tended to dominate thinking. It has been the place where many people in Africa, uh, Mike, Mike, you mentioned your own history in this, have themselves been educated. And I don't decry it at all. I think it's a fantastic contribution, which uh, a, a British person like myself should feel proud of. And it's been a very important con contribution to the world. I don't withdraw from that in any way. But there is a very important African dimension that needs to play its role in this. And so when you're looking at the economy, for example, and going back to this point about understanding and interpreting, what is the story of the economy of Africa? How has that evolved over centuries? Where is it going? What are the competitive strengths of African society and African individuals in being able to meet the economic challenges of the future? Is Africa fated simply to copy in some sense what's been done in other countries, the former colonial powers or the uh, United States of America or China or whatever it might be, or can it develop its own contribution? Now, I know it's already doing that, and I'm speaking certainly to the converted in saying this, but I do think you need to assert the African economic dimension in the world context. What is the economic future of Africa? 
what is the particular contribution that Africa can bring to the prosperity of the world and how it operates? These are big questions. I'm putting the questions, which is easy, not giving the answers, which is difficult. But the point is that African universities need to really find ways of thinking about those questions and saying Africa has a major contribution to make in these ways. And that applies to, to the particular sub uh, thinking about the place of work. Uh, it's not just the economy in general, but it's the place of work. How is work going to operate um, with artificial intelligence, with uh, a whole set of different skills required? What is work going to look like in Africa, um, in Nairobi or uh, in uh, <coughs> Dar es Salaam? What are going to be, the, how are people going to be working? What is the society going to look like? What is the form of society? What should we be trying to create as a society which can look to the future in that way? And of course, culture and history, I think one of the great sadnesses of the way that the um, world has developed, the, thinking, the, the thought process in the world, is some of Africa's unique contribution, and I do mean unique contribution to the history of humankind, uh, coming from East Africa in particular, is given insufficient value in the history of the world as we think about where things were. And you have expertise and knowledge and understanding. Uh, there are all kinds of post-colonial issues at the moment. There's a massive issues going on in Britain around the Black Lives Matter movement about how we should deal with our culture and our history and issues about artifacts which were stolen from the African continent at various points by, by the British and are now displayed in various place, parts of Britain. How should we be dealing with that history in an effective and positive way? And I do think uh, the reason I put all of these subjects in this box, research, understanding and interpreting, which was the first of the three roles of the universities, is I would say there is a very particular role for African universities in this context for East African universities to say, how are we going to tell our story of the African dimension of all these things? It's not simply a question of looking at what research is being done elsewhere in the world and applying it to African conditions. It's a question also saying, what is the African contribution in all of these ways? Now, it's a complicated and difficult process, uh, but I think it's a, an important part of those goals which the EAC and the African Union set out in their declarations for the future about the self-confidence of the country, uh, of the continent and the, uh, of its peoples. So I would say that is very important. So I think the research dimension, there is a specific uh, African dimension, which is important. And I then come to the uh, next slide, um, harnessing this research for general benefit. Um, here, this is a very difficult question because some people in universities are skeptical about any wider social obligation of universities. Uh, we introduced in Britain, I did when I was Secretary of State in, uh, of Education in Britain, the idea of assessing impact was the word used of research. For research to be funded by the government, it would need to demonstrate its impact on wider society. And many academics said impact, what's that? It's nothing to do with us, how our research is used. It's nothing to do with the wider society. Uh, we have a right to kind of think deep thoughts and that's it. I've never agreed with that. <laughs> I think research should have a practical component uh, more widely. And that, so the question of harnessing it to general benefit is particularly important. There are lots of very particular examples. I've mentioned a couple of them. The, uh, uh, the uh, climate change, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the pandemics, the aging society or the younging society. So what's the demographic profile of the society going to be? How is migration affecting uh, what's happening for a variety of different reasons and so on? The society needs answers to how we can best address these challenges. Uh, we shouldn't just leave it to political leaders and industrial leaders. You need an informed science-based approach. So I say that in that research element, it's necessary to focus on problem solving and knowledge about how to address change. That needs to be a component of an individual's research. And you can write that in at the very beginning of a research project to say, how are we going to deal with these problems? 
one needs to try and get strong relationships outside the university with employers, with public and private sector employers, uh, with the, uh, a, a wide range of different organisations to look at what the future of these uh, activities is and what skills are going to be needed and to uh, develop local research and knowledge to transfer to have the biggest impact in those areas. Those relationships aren't always there. They're often a kind of sniffy relationship, I think, between employers and universities where employers think universities are getting on with the rather low-grade business and making money, and uh, employers think that universities are getting on with a rather distant and vague aspect of thinking things. Not good enough either approach. You've got to find an engaged approach to talk about the various issues which there are there. And that applies to the university contribution to the public and governmental ambitions. I do think you are fortunate in East Africa in having EAC Vision 2050, as you go through the document, you can see the wide range of different dimensions of society, which the Vision 2050 tries to address. And each of them uh, raise the question, raises the question um, to universities, what can universities contribute to fulfilling that vision? Whether it's better transport systems, uh, better places of work, better caring systems, better social care, whatever it might be. And the EAC vision gives you an agenda for which universities can go through subject by subject and say, okay, what's our capacity in the universities in the East African community to be able to offer some research which can help get us to a better place in achieving those ambitions. And that's, uh, I think, a fairly straightforward process to go through. Again, easy to state, much more difficult to achieve. And then finally, I suggest here promoting um, research networks in the EAC. I think that's just a worthwhile thing, which I think you already do in a variety of different ways, but I just thought I would mention it. So the third university function is education and training to high quality. And here I think the main point I want to emphasize is flexibility. Uh, universities have worked in very traditional ways for a course for a certain amount of time, students coming in a certain type of way, uh, forms of education which are uh, traditional and convention type. What these changing situations mean, in my opinion, is we need far greater level of flexibility in offering new modes of study. So is it simply the lecture theatre, the essay? Is it online by a variety of different means? Is it uh, seminars by Zoom meetings such as this? Uh, what's the what are the types of modes of study that will work best? Now, uh, there won't be a best system. It's a question of having a variety of good systems and trying to fit them to what the students are looking for and what the others are about. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but it's a question of trying to be flexible and offer new modes of study. Similarly, the structure of courses. Uh, there's already a, a wide range of different types of course, different lengths. Is it three years? Is it one year? Is it sandwich course working with industry and employer? What are the different forms of course structures that could operate? Um, and the modes of delivery as well. So fundamentally, uh, flexibility, including the ability of people to start university courses at different points in their lives. There are many people who will have missed out on the opportunity of universities early in life who might very well be able to benefit later in life by taking a university course and coming in for the sake of argument at the age of 40 or studying a part-time course where the learning that they're doing is principally part-time side by side with their work rather than principally uh, a full-time study option. And flexibility in what can be offered is very important. And if I may say so, Coy, I think it's something where the uh, EAC universities uh, the whole organization which you are is in a good position to coordinate and uh, bring together shared approaches in these areas so giving students a wider range of options for deciding what they want to do and how they want to do it whatever system of study you establish needs also to have a system of accreditation which is agreed with the relevant professional bodies so if you're going to be an engineer, an architect, a doctor, a nurse, whatever it may happen to be, there needs to be a system which makes sure that the 
university study is accredited and linking with the professional body. So you don't have to go through another set of qualifications, another set of processes to be able to deal with it. And it is, as I said earlier, lifelong. It's a question of retraining, updating, continuous professional development throughout life. If you're qualified as a teacher today at the age of 22, you will require a whole different skill, set of skills in 38 years time when you hit the age of 60. So question, to what extent can you update your skills? That's even more true in fields like medicine and nursing, where that's the case. It's true in fields like agriculture, where the techniques move forward in different ways. So can you have an upgrading approach? I do put in here also pastoral care, because I think that there is a question in this very tense world of ensuring students get support in trying to uh, address the challenges they themselves face in life. So I think getting an element of pastoral care. And then, of course, access and pre-university courses uh, is very important to enable a wider range of people to go to university. Now, this is a very challenging slide. I've put it very simply with just these uh, five bullet points on the approach, but each of the bullet points is complicated and difficult. And I would say sets an agenda for what you as universities can be thinking about for the future, both for your own university, but also for universities working with others. So I now come to the fourth uh, role of universities, which is the creating the strong intellectual climate uh, that I think is so important. Um, and that's um, very much a, uh, uh, an aspect that I was talking about earlier, which I think has gone up the agenda in recent times. Um, I do think it's about leadership and governance of universities. Uh, some university leaders are very good. I used to play a, a game when I was Secretary of State for Education, looking at 150 universities in Britain. How many were in the best 50? How many were in the worst 50? And trying to work out what the Vice Chancellors thought of all of those uh, various points and they varied in quality. But universities have to be ruthless uh, with governance structures which enable them to do that, uh, to, uh, uh, to move forward. Ben, could you possibly move on to the next slide, please? It's the creating strong intellectual, thank you very much, creating the strong inte intellectual climate. So it's the leadership and governance of universities which have to be ready to be strong and consultative, not dictatorial, but at the same time decisive. It's a very difficult ask. And you're trying to build within the universities diverse and respectful university communities. We live in a world where there's a fashion can take over and certain types of thinking can completely dominate and exclude others. Uh, that's not a good thing at the end of the day. You need to have a situation where people are able to think lightly, are able to uh, share their views in confidence where they know where everybody needs to know and i emphasize that word respectful that the fact that other people's views are respected even if you disagree with them and that's uh, an except and that's an important and difficult line to draw and process to uh, to achieve you need to take that more widely into local civic and community engagement uh, with the local society more generally and you need to develop a local community strategy, both on industry plus civic. So what is the future of a particular town, a particular community? Where is it going to be in the future? <clears throat> the university needs to play a central role into that area. So those are the four functions of universities, which I particularly wanted to highlight. As I said, and I emphasize it uh, again, uh, the fact is, and we all know, that uh, these are all difficult, and maybe we'll discuss it more in this webinar this morning. But the next slide is about the hard thing, resources, how do you pay for it all? Universities are under great financial pressure uh, most of the time, and I think there's a whole set of different uh, ways in which you can think about funding. Mike mentioned in his introduction the advent of private universities into the university system of East Africa, um, a moment ago. And so the traditional model is not always, uh, doesn't always have to be followed. But I identify here five different potential sources of resources for universities. First is the state, the government, in whatever funding they put in. Secondly is the individual student in fees they pay to go to university. 
Third is the employer, uh, and which certainly in the UK system pays far less than it ought to. There should be far more contribution by employers to university costs. Fourth is philanthropy, and um, it's quite difficult to develop that if uh, there's not a well-established alumni base, but you can do something. And then there's international support. So Mike mentioned uh, DFID earlier on, but whether that's in money or in kind. Now, those, those five sources of resources need to be thought about in that context. It's quite striking. Uh, we list in the book, second commercial, uh, the, uh, in going through this, the wide variety across countries of the extent to which uh, of the different levels of funding which come from different sources. It's quite surprising. You'd think that countries from broadly similar positions would have a broadly similar type of amount of money coming from the government as opposed to the individual student. It's not the case. There's a very wide variety of different areas uh, of uh, financial support. I'm not expert enough uh, in uh, your countries to know what the right balance is or to even make sensible comments about what the right balance is. But what I do know is going back to the basics of analyzing what these five sources uh, can give for targets that you want to do is really worth thinking about. Linking the sources back to the roles of the university is important. It may well be much easier to get support for educating and training people than for some aspects of research or for civic engagement. And you can look, there, there may be different types of partnership between the university and potential funders to deal with particular challenges that, that the university is taking place. But I think as an exercise for your community to discuss what are the potential sources and what could be done in this area, it's an interesting and worthwhile exercise. Um, I work with a group of universities internationally, which is trying to do some more, give some more financial support for uh, universities in Africa. And I think it is a very interesting thing to think how we can discuss what could be done. I think there are resources to be mobilized, but it requires thinking what's it for and how will it be run? Will it be run well to carry it through? So on the next slide, the uh, penultimate slide of this presentation, um, I just talk about universities and their partners uh, needing to be able to address uh, these issues around. Ben, if you could put up the next slide, that'd be great, please. Yes, uh, universities and their partners. Um, and what we're trying to achieve uh, is universities with their range of different partners, governmental employers, uh, civic organizations, charities, and so on, international organizations. Ben, could you possibly put up the next slide, please? No, not at the moment. Okay, well, I'll, 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 I'll say it. Oh, there we are. Thank you very much, Ben. Understanding change in East Africa, that's the single most important thing. What's going on in East Africa? Understanding that we're talking 30 years into the future, not 30 years back in the past. Working out what those challenges of the future are. What are the real difficult problems that have to be sorted out, whether they're scientific, social, or whatever it might be. Thirdly, providing the skills of the future, ensuring that universities are educating and training people in the skills that will make the future succeed. Promoting creativity and intelligence uh, to deal with these various issues. And I think particularly it's been brought home to us in these COVID uh, period. Resilience, resourcefulness, innovation. How can universities help build a resilient, resourceful, and innovative society? And then finally, promoting the values of a strong society. So my final slide, uh, Ben, if you could put up the final slide, please. Reaching East Africa 2050, looking forward, not back, future, not the past, trying to get consistent focus and leadership. And here I do think your community of universities has a real strength compared to other parts of the continent. You can have dialogue, work together, and say how across our six countries can we uh, develop focus and leadership on those key challenges. How do you get wider support and engagement from governments, from uh, businesses, from international organizations for what you're trying to do? And how do you build these partnerships so they work really well? So Coy, what I've tried to do in going through this presentation, sorry, I've gone a couple of minutes over my uh, time, is just really to raise a number of questions 
for uh, the uh, universities in East Africa as to how they can ensure that the societies of which you're all a part get to 2050 with the country looking something like what you're hoping to achieve at the moment. It's an enormous challenge, but I, I end where I started. It's universities which have the capacity to make that change, that can make it happen. You're the best placed organizations to succeed. And if you do it well, you really have the enormous fulfillment of transforming the societies of which you're a part. Thank you again for your time this morning. Thank you so much, uh, Charles. Um, and the questions are coming in. You've raised a lot of uh, good questions and there's a robust conversation happening in the chat room. Um, as I bring in all the other panelists, I just want confirmation that we have them all on, on site. Uh, Vice Chancellor Makerere University, uh, Buana Nang, is, is he available? Is he here, Prof? Yes, he is. Can you see him? Excellent. Um, I just, I'm just taking a roll call. Um, uh, DVC of Dar es Salaam University, uh, Professor Rutinwa, are you here? Okay. I know we have Professor Gitahi and we have Professor uh, Mu, um, Margaret from um, Pan African University. And uh, I just want to check if Professor Alexandra is here. Uh, the former. Yes, yes, I saw. Yes, that. I am. Oh, awesome. So I just wanted to make sure you're all here um, as we move to the next uh, stage of our discussion. Um, Charles, part of the things that you said this morning that I want to just reiterate as we go into this conversation is the importance of us thinking through the purpose of why institutions were established. And that was also um, resonates with the comments that uh, Professor Kuria mentioned earlier. Why were the universities established? And are the universities that we have now serving the needs of our community? And are they going to bring Africa uh, past the precipice and into greatness? So you talked about understanding and interpreting what the changes we need to have going forward are, engaging with our societies in a way that creates a culturally um, relevant means of moving the change process. And I think when you mentioned cultural sensitivity in several of your slides, um, and, and us understanding what our African contribution is, that's very important. And some of the comments um, that I'm hoping we will have a chance to address during our question and answer time uh, what is the role of um, uh, imposter syndrome? That is a question that has come up. And what is the role of Africans combating intellectual imperialism? How do we make the African ways of knowing and the African ways of understanding ourselves relevant on an international stage in a scientifically or an intellectual uh, environment. So you spoke of um, the scientific method. I want to throw that in there, that Africans are basically storytellers. That's how we have most often transferred our information. And we are competency-based learners. When I think of the way I learned about the herbs from my grandmother, um, that may not always fit snugly with the scientific um, method. But are there other ways of knowing, ways of research, like qualitative research or mixed methods that would allow Africans as intellectuals um, gain that confidence to step up onto the global stage? You also mentioned the quality of training, effective training that helps us deal with change. You mentioned problem solving, and uh, that also takes into consideration critical thinking. And I've seen a lot of universities in the, uh, begin to teach or integrate critical thinking into their courses. Um, how is that actually helping us solve relevant, real problems in society? And I think that might also address, your comments later might all, on that might also address the issue of unemployed graduates. You also finally mentioned that um, we must develop for ourselves as Africans an intellectual engaging climate that allows not only our culture to stand for front, 
front and center, but also allow us to continue in the intellectual exercises that, have, uh, that the university is known for. Um, as we move towards the uh, panelists, um, I know some of these institutions have developed what we call linkage officers or liaison officers with industry that pull together the quadruple helix, which you mentioned in your presentation, where academia, government, um, society, and um, industry work together to make sure that skills are relevant, that quality of training is happening, and that the modes of training that you spoke of, the flex stability around the modes of training is addressed in a way that helps to deliver to professionals and to deliver to society the kinds of experts, the skilled labor that we need. Finally, before I move forward to the panelists, um, you mentioned in your book um, the importance that an increased life expect expectancy is having now. Um, and that leads to the comments you were making on lifelong learning. Um, I want you to think a little bit about how do we bring in the 40-sums, the 50-some people who are 40-something years and 50-something years, they've been experts in industry, uh, may never have gotten an academic qualification, but they are, have such knowledge that they're gonna be living until they're 90 and 100. How do we capture that? Now, Makerere University, I believe, is one of the only universities, at least it was the first university to start mature entry. Um, and that, in a way, has given the East African context a way to acknowledge prior learning, even where there may not be a high school certificate, to enter into several streams um, in the university structure. So please do make comment on that. I know the Germans do something called the uh, uh, industry professorship? Is it something that we would be able to do when we do it, if we do it, how do we give accreditation and recognition for it? So I would like now to bring um, to the forefront our panelists. Um, and I think I'm still looking at the chat uh, and looking at the questions that are coming in and um, we will be channeling them to the panelists. We do have a 45 minute question and answer time at the end of this session. And so I would like um, the panelists to go. I will give each panelist 12 minutes um, to make your remarks. Uh, that will give us a hedge of at least one minute. Um, and then we'll be able to capture our time. So I would like to start with um, Prof Prof Professor Barnabas from Makerere University, our Vice Chancellor. First, receive our <laughs> condolences on the incidents at Makerere and we believe that the tower will be and the building will be restored as it's a, a landmark for many of us. Um, Professor, welcome to make your remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kivuga, for that message of sympathy. And I can assure you that uh, most of the building sort of collapsed, but the tower is defiant. The tower is standing up. And I want to thank all my colleagues around the world who have been uh, sending us messages of uh, sympathy. Uh, uh, Prof, I want to thank uh, Mr. Charles uh, Chuck for his uh, very informative presentation. And uh, uh, particularly, I want to comment on, his, on the issue around the importance of research. I think uh, more than ever before, the importance of research in our, on our continent has been brought out during this COVID time. Uh, when everybody is uh, really struggling to find out how we can control and contain this pandemic, uh, since apparently the rest of the world has said, let everybody cater for themselves. And uh, I think what we have seen here at Makerere uh, the enthusiasm with which our researchers came out to, to, to tackle the issue of the pandemic has shown that the potential for research is extremely huge. And uh, what really is the, the issue now for us is how do we prioritize research in the universities and how do we fund this research? Uh, 
Traditionally, our research funding has come from uh, what uh, uh, Charles calls the international partners. I think until last year, 80%, uh, maybe 90% of all our research funding was coming from international partners. It is only last year that the government started funding research directly. Uh, and the, probably now the, uh, the funding, the, the, the component by international funders has dropped maybe to about 70%. Uh, and maybe next year it will drop further to 60% because of the continued funding by the government. But I think that is extremely important. Uh, so uh, we, the, we needed to see how we convince our governments that uh, they need to really seriously uh, in, 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 I mean, in invest in, in research at the universities. Now, we are about 60 universities in, in Uganda, and uh, about 12 of those are, are, are government-funded uh, universities. But that research funding is coming just to Makerere. The other, even the other government-funded universities are not getting that research funding. And so what we have done is to say, can we then involve the other universities? Because they need to develop their capacity to do research. And so we have invited the, the, the other government universities to work with us. We are actually also working with the private universities which have shown interest in research. So the, the researchers can write proposals and then they can invite uh, colleagues from the other universities. But uh, I'm trying here to bring out the role of uh, the more endowed universities uh, uh, in, in Africa that have got the research capacity, and I'm thinking about universities like in Nairobi, Dar es Salaam, uh, and the, the other bigger universities in the East African region that would need to nurture the younger universities. Uh, the importance of uh, the research being relevant to society cannot be overemphasized. With our level of, of, of research funding, it will still be a little bit difficult to compete with the universities that uh, can spend, you know, millions of dollars on, uh, on basic, basic research, just trying to understand the, uh, the, 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 the behavior of nature. I think with our level of funding and with the issues that we have around us, climate change, emerging diseases, uh, poverty and the unemployment, we might need to utilize our resources more on what Charlie says, impact impact the society. And, uh, and probably uh, when we get a benefactor who says, I want you to research on this other thing, uh, that could be okay. But with the, 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 the legal resources we have, I think we need to concentrate on that. I also want to react to his comments on uh, uh, flexibility and the, and the continuous professional development. Uh, and I think that is where uh, the moderator is also talking about uh, the mature age scheme. Yes, the, the, the way our universities were set up during the colonial time basically was to provide some human resource to support the colonial governments. And uh, that culture seemed to remain around for quite some time. It is just of recent that we have really uh, started changing the culture and saying, you know, uh, we are not here just to produce human resources for, for, the, for the government. We are here to also be partners in creation of knowledge around the world and in solving the problems of society, not just the human resource issues. And so continuous professional development, I think, is extremely important, especially with the changing environments. With COVID-19, we are all saying we need to move to online education. We had, at Makere, we had the policy on this for a very long time, but we were not implementing it at the same speed that we wanted. Now the reality has set in, and we are all saying we must move online immediately. And we are saying in the, in the circumstances where we had not prepared our staff to say this is going to be the future. And now we, have, we are having to, to do very, uh, you know, agent training of staff. We are beginning to say, how do we now manage the, 
the students find the rural areas who might not have access, we're trying to think on how we go around that and so on. So we need to, ha to have that flex flexibility. And of course, we are getting uh, members of staff who are saying, but me, I'm used to teaching on uh, the traditional method. I, I, I don't know how I can teach online. We are insisting, we say now, this is the, the no, no longer the future, but this is the reality and everybody has to, to do that. So continuous professional development, I think is extremely uh, important. Now, uh, the COVID-19 situation is changing a lot of things and maybe just a comment on what uh, Charles calls the resources and how, where are the resources coming from? Uh, being a government sponsored institution, uh, we are not as badly affected as our colleagues who must depend on student fees. Because uh, even as the university is closed and people are basically not uh, doing a lot of work, apart from a few who must keep the university running, people are still getting their salaries. Uh, you see, ironically, in Uganda, I always say, even in the COVID situation, the government increases salaries. And that is something that we need to study and say, how can they manage that when actually there are sectors where people are not getting, getting salaries? So that might not be a, a, a big problem for now, for, for us as a government sponsored the university. But I think as we move towards really wanting to be part of the international community at that level in research, uh, there will be a need for us to identify alternative sources that should supplement uh, the, the funding from government. Because 80% of all the, our funding from government actually goes to paying salaries. So we must look for funds from elsewhere to make sure that we are doing quality and, and impactful research, that we are keeping our infrastructure uh, I mean, uh, good enough for, for research and also for training of students and all the other activities that we are involved in. Uh, and finally, uh, the, I want to also comment on the value of partnerships. Partnerships within the region and partnerships beyond the region. Uh, in, the, in the East African region, we have been lucky that we have been brought together by the Inter-University Council for East Africa. And that somehow coordinates a, a lot of things. But even beyond the Inter-University Council for East Africa, there has been the traditional collaboration between uh, the three uh, big universities, that is uh, Nairobi, Dar es Salaam, and Makerere. And we have been doing things like uh, external examination, joint research. There's a lot of joint research that goes on beyond uh, researchers at these universities because of that uh, sort of traditional arrangement. But I think we need now to enhance even that in the, the situation where we are and look at the possibility of uh, conducting some uh, programs, particularly graduate programs, jointly because in, uh, we do not have the capacity at each of these universities to be independent in that area. And uh, so I think that that is something that we need to explore and exploit. And uh, the international partnerships are invaluable. Uh, just this accident we have had at Makere, we are having an outpouring of sympathy from all, all over the world with the people saying, what can we do to help? Mm. But even with the COVID, the first money we got to do our, for, for the whole country, the first money to do what we call community survey came from partners. The, it is the partners who sent us the test kits, you know, universities in the UK, I mean in the US, UK and the, and the Netherlands actually gave us the equipment as a university to be in charge of community survey, surveillance for the whole country. Mm -hmm. And so uh, apart from, of course, the, the research, the joint research we have been doing, uh, with them. So, uh, Prof. Yes, thank you very much, Prof. What I would like to say at the moment. Thank you very much. You've mentioned a couple of things that are really, really important. The role of partnerships. Um, and I wanted to just pick that up. You talked about the role of partnerships when it comes to research, not just public institutions with public institutions, but public institutions that have the funding. Uh, partnering with public institutions, partnering with 
private institutions, and I want to throw in something else, partnering with vocational technical institutions, especially when it comes to making the um, qualifications and the training relevant, partnering with industry. Um, in Kenya, one of the things that uh, we were very uh, committed to fighting um, when I, as, as I sit on LIWA board is that most of the industries in Kenya are still getting their R&D development, research and development done by institutions outside the country. So how do we even partner with industry to enhance research um, and relative applied research, hardcore research um, in our institutions? So that was very good to hear from you. We also, you also mentioned the importance of um, working across the flexibility on how do we uh, create new kinds of uh, modes of learning. So you talked about the challenge that I think all, all universities across the world have been going through recently with the COVID um, challenge is that our policies and our objectives and our strategic plans for developing virtual learning and online platforms, mobile platforms have been there for years, but we haven't really um, implemented a lot of them. And so the COVID situation has been a challenge for that. And I think one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm throwing out to the entire uh, webinar community is how do we assess online learning very well? And I think the, the, the new technologies actually challenge the traditional modes of teaching. And I think uh, Charles mentioned that we have to move away from the sages on the stages to the students in the, in, in, the, in the chairs, moving away from the focus on teaching to a focus on learning. But how do we truly assess virtual learning, online learning, and learning in these new modes and platforms? Um, I would like to now shift to uh, our next panelists. Thank you very much, sir, for keeping time. I can see Makerere is good on that. Um, I will give you also uh, 12 minutes. Professor Rutinwa from Dar es Salaam, are you here? You will need to unmute. Yes, Hello? there you go. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I know your time is precious as it is for most of us here. Um, I would like you to really, in your comments, talk to us about, uh, we know Tanzania has had a, a, a different approach in how it has handled COVID. How has that impacted uh, the continuation of teaching and learning at your institutions? As you also make comment uh, and respond to uh, the uh, message that, um, the presentation that Charles gave us. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Koi, for involving us in this webinar. I'd also like to join the Vice Chancellor of Makere University to, to congratulate the Right Honorable Charles Clark for indeed a very informative presentation. Um, we at the University of Dar es Salaam really appreciate this presentation because it's very much in line with, with what we are doing right now. The University of Dar es Salaam started on 25th October 1961. And since then, it has been trying to change to align itself and to make sure it is relevant, its relevance to the current situation. As of now, the University of Dar es Salaam is guided by, the, by what is called Vision 2061 and which has a lot of resonance with the presentation, with, with the presentation that has been made this morning. Can you hear me? Can you? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, thank you very much. Vision 2061 commits the university to be a, cent a leading center of intellectual wealth, spearheading the quest for sustainable and inclusive development. And our mission is to advance economic, social, and technological development in Tanzania and beyond through excellent teaching and learning, research, knowledge exchange, and public service. And many of these 
has resonance with what has been presented this morning. Our core functions are very much the same as have been presented by Right Honorable Clark, which are teaching and learning, research, and knowledge exchange. Our strategies involve also mobilization of resources to achieve these ends. And really, our challenge revolves around what was his last, more, more or less the last slide, paying it all. Like our brothers or sisters, Makerele, the University of the Sun is a public university. And when it started, it was funded 100% by the state with some donor inputs. But as years went by, that funding has become quite inadequate to fulfill our needs. So we are trying to diversify. Um, I've noted the proposed other sources of funding for education. Some of those would be very challenging for Tanzania in our situation. For example, students. Most of our students still come from very poor families, which really they themselves need support. So they will not be in a position to make a significant contribution towards supporting education. Philanthropy has been mentioned. Uh, given our level of development and our background as a former socialist state, there isn't really a big pub, a private sector state which can uh, do philanthropic giving. So really, our sources of funding as of now still remain in the state as well as some international uh, supports. So what are we doing about this at the University of Dar es Salaam? One, we have devised a strategy to, to tap into our own internal resources, to use internally generated resources for the purposes of supporting our functions and our mission. For example, with the effect from just last year, the University of Dar es Salaam decided to set up its own scholarship fund. Previously, either you are supported, you are funded by the government, or by a donor, or by yourself if you can. Now the University of Dar es Salaam has started awarding merit scholarships, and in fact also scholarships for students in need, and we have set up funds for that. Also, the University of Dar es Salaam has decided to start funding its own research itself. Currently, the amount we have set aside is not big. It's about $1 million over 2 billion Tanzanian shillings, but this is just a start. So I'm trying to share this experience so that maybe other inventors may also consider funding their own research. But we are also trying to develop partnerships with industry where we can. For example, currently we have um, a 10 year agreement with the uh, Barrick Gold Tanzania, under which they will put in some 10 million US dollars into supporting various activities of the University of Dar es Salaam. So this is what we are trying to do about addressing the question of how do you pay for your vision. I have been asked also to talk about how Tanzania responded to COVID-19 and what that, does, what does that mean for higher education. The response of the University of Dar es Salaam to COVID as well as other universities was very much aligned to the national response. As I'm sure you're all aware, we in, here in Tanzania, the government did not impose a lockdown. However, perhaps the education sector was the only exception where you would say there was some form of a lockdown because all education institutions were closed down on 13th March and universities reopened on 1st June and secondary schools later. So there was some sort of lockdown when it comes to, to university. However, during that time, we made preparations to be able to receive students and, and conduct our academic activities safely. Among other things, we started working on introducing online teaching because we didn't know when students would, would, would come back. Already, the university, the university currently has a five year rolling strategic plan 2020 to 2025 which had set a goal of all academic programs going online by 2013 we decided to bring forward 
that deadline to this year. So as we are speaking, we have teams working to ensure that all our academic programs can be offered online by the start of next year, although we have resumed classes. But also we invested in research uh, with COVID-related interventions, which included sanitary equipment, but also some medication for complications related to, to COVID. For example, we made sanitizers. We also produced some concoctions that could help people who have suffered some respiratory diseases. We call it Fukiza. So, and it has worked since when we resumed the studies on the 1st of June until when we closed the, the semester some one week ago, we didn't suffer any case of, uh, any fatal case of, of uh, which is COVID related. So I believe um, the approach in Tanzania is working and we welcome anyone who wants to learn from our experience to, 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 to join us. I have been given 12 minutes. I will not want to take too much time. Maybe I will respond to some of the questions should they come my way. Thank you very much. Let me end here for the time being. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, and indeed, we uh, are here for knowledge sharing and learning from one another. So thank you for the invitation to come and learn from uh, how you're, you were able to address the issue. One of the things that uh, you mentioned is that we need to continue as part of is your mission uh, in, uh, at the University of Dar es Salaam to provide relevant real-time training for our graduates. And I can see on the chat room, there's a lot of conversation around, uh, are we delivering relevant uh, graduates? Are we training job seekers or job creators? Are we really linking in with innovation? And what is the role of innovation in um, changing the way our graduates think about their role in society? Are our graduates or are the graduates of Dar es Salaam able to really engage with their communities? Or uh, do our graduates have the, the government mentality that um, since I went to university, I must therefore get a job and I think VC of Makerere mentioned that we have to move away from training clerks for the government to training skilled workers for our communities. So as we come back to you during the question and answer time, uh, Prof, um, please think about those, uh, those comments and those sentiments. Um, the other thing that I think I would like to challenge um, you to think about as, long, uh, uh, as well as the other panelists. And this was mentioned in Charles's presentation. How are we enhancing diversity at the university across its governance structures? Uh, and how are we then also increase, increasing and improving our student population? So how are we working to enhance diversity in our governance structures, in our human capital at the universities, and how is it reflected in our student population as they come in? Um, and, and with that, I wanted to mention, um, I don't know if you, I'm, I'm sure most of you have seen online, the, the, in social media, the slides that are going around uh, looking at the countries that have been led by women and how effectively they dealt with COVID versus countries that have been led by men. Of course, there aren't that many, but it might inform us and might even give us an opportunity for research as we go through. Um, I would like to now welcome our, our next panelist. Thank you very much. Um, who is um, Professor Kiama Getahi from uh, Nairobi University. Um, Nairobi University has been, is, one, is the oldest university in, Nairobi, in Kenya for us. Um, and I'm eager to see how is Nairobi University leveraging its history, its capacity for the future? What are you doing, Professor Gitahi, at Nairobi University to leverage itself for the next 50 years? What is the thinking? What are the policies? And how are you 
engaging with change management and creating change management part of your culture, looking forward to the next 50 years. Professor Gitahi? Very, Prof, are you well. on? Thank yes, you. I'm, I'm, I'm on. Eh? And thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Koi. Koi. Uh, thank you, Mike, for reaching out so that we could also come here and contribute. Um, I'm happy also to be here as one of the panelists with the other members, uh, including my counterpart, uh, Mudui and uh, Mangrit. Mangrit, Adenabanabas uh, Nawangwe. The, the presentation by, by Charles Clark was excellent. Um, I think as I was listening, it brought to mind one very uh, important issue, and that is uh, uh, who would suffer if the university was closed? If, if, if that university, whether it's University of Nairobi or it's Makerere or it's Dar es Salaam or any other university, that it was just closed here. Yeah. Uh, and, and who would actually care? Because I think his presentation tried to address all those issues. Um, and if those issues are not addressed in the manner that he was proposing, then you would find that uh, you, it would be hard to find who would care. Maybe, maybe the workers in the university who would lose jobs, yeah. And that would be dangerous. I think as uh, Mike, you talked about that you are thinking about the the strategic plan for the universities, uh, community for the next uh, five or so years. I think that is the biggest question. Have the university lived true to their original mandate? Yeah. Why they were established? And are they today doing what they are supposed to do? And are they preparing themselves for the future? In this, in this country, I think there is some time we had a problem with the government, I think 1991, they are about. And the, that, the president at that time, President Moy, just left us alone. And I said, he said that the university scholars have so much time, they're asking for more money. Why can't they use for the time they have to look for money elsewhere? And uh, we closed for one year. And, and I think the country, uh, what I could feel, I was young staff then, just been hired. And therefore, the, you, you could not feel, the, the country was not refabulating with us. You could feel, even as you have closed and you have gone away, there was really no, and it is because uh, perhaps we did not have such what, what we are having today to reflect uh, as a university. What are we doing? Would the world at large care? Would the local communities care? Maybe the students, because they have lost a near. But even those who lost a near, they came back and continued with their studies. Yeah. So that is the biggest issue. Who would care? Uh, who would suffer? I think I would uh, just summarize his presentation in that context. And if we reflected on that, uh, then uh, we would be able to, to, to get the university of the future. He addressed a number of, of, of things which he uh, categorized by beginning with talking about the, the ambitions. Uh, how we wanted to have a prosperous uh, uh, and people driven and the university being at the core of this. How are the universities dealing with the change and the University of Nairobi has tried a bit during even the COVID, the disruption. And when the, 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 the president declared that uh, all uh, educational institutions should close, uh, we actually closed for just about two, two weeks. And by that time, I was just thinking uh, and, and wondering what next? There are those who say, Do I share COVID? I love who we truly. And I just thought that. Uh, the university should, in the first instance, be able to give hope and the faith to the people. And if we just close and go home, 
just like a primary school has done, a secondary school has done, then uh, that is not university. And we pride on innovation. We, pro we pride on uh, commitment as our values. That a student will complete their program, we will teach them, we will do this, and that we will use innovative ways. So I called back Senate, and we were able to reflect on what we require to give hope and faith to the Kenyan people. And we went back. We, we, we used the technology that we had, and we moved to virtual learning uh, for all our programs, postgraduate, undergraduate program, including the, the, the defenses of the, of, of the, of the physicists yeah, and the projects. And uh, as a result, we are able to graduate. We have graduation tomorrow. We were able to admit a new cohort of students. And we have not lost any of our academic year. Uh, because of that, that as a university, we say, first and foremost, we must be able to give faith and hope to our Kenyan people. Now, when you reflect uh, why the universities were formed, and, and, and that has been, uh, he has also um, uh, talked about it in terms of the issue of the high quality uh, universities, uh, the issue of the universities of the future, the university age. The, the first mandate is obviously quality university education. But quality in the university education that is relevant. Relevance is also very important. And how do we make it relevant? Do we make it relevant by using the same methods that we were using before? Today, most of the knowledge is available, easily available online. Are we teaching uh, students the same method that we used to teach them before? We come before the classroom and then uh, tell them these are the diseases and these are the clinical signs you see, or engineering, we do the same thing. Is it the same thing? How do we revisit this whole thing and start looking at how can uh, the student be taught how to search for knowledge? To be creative, to be critical thinkers, as we are talking about high quality education that is also relevant to today. In fact, you find some of the students actually, the young people go to the university and they are dropping out because they listen to the teacher and they don't know what they are talking about because that material is already available. And they will think that actually they will read it later and they will understand it. Then it turns out to be a bit complex when they do that. So they fail. Many of them, you find they are doing supplementaries and all this because they say this information that I have to attend classes from morning to evening is actually available. Can we now meet them somehow by making it relevant, by packaging it perhaps in experiential learning or perhaps in the problem based? And that will require a culture change. I think he mentioned the issue of culture also. Yeah. How do we change our scholars? And you know, many of them have been there since the universities were formed in 1950. And some others were hired there later. They, so the, the way they were taught is the only way they know. How do, we, how do we change them? So that they can meet because they say, oh, these students are not coming to my class. I remember one time I, I, as a, the, in my administrative role in the lower level, I had introduced the Wi-Fi in, even in lecture theaters. And one time one of the, the, the faculty board met there and uh, they said that this Wi-Fi, which is in lecture theater, is interrupting students from listening because they are searching on mobile phone. I think Mike, you talked about the HO mobile phone. They are, they are checking on, micro, on, on mobile phone. As I'm teaching them, they are also checking. And they need just to listen to me as the person is presenting uh, PowerPoint and he, he wants to see the student writing what they are presenting. And they are saying, ah, this one is already here. And what they were proposing is, can I uh, then uh, remove the Wi-Fi? 
And that was quite shocking because the, the thing is, the information is there. What is it you are doing? Could you, if you probably give them the problem, they would have such the knowledge and come and have a discussion with you. Yeah. So that is how do we make our education more relevant? And how do we ensure that the universities go beyond access? Because many of them could have been established to over uh, degrees in the various areas. When you read at the Foundation of University of Nairobi, and the, the discussion that was there at that time was to see how do we uh, ensure that a student can get degrees. But today, you can get degrees factually. You can register in some other university in another place. Why do you have to register in Makerere? Why do you, why do you have to register in the University of Nairobi? It must be that other value that is added to you, that you can be able to solve problems, your own problems, and that you can be able to solve the problems you see and you encounter in your community. How can we, as universities of today and in the future, create an innovation culture in our universities? We have many students who are graduating with PhDs and masters. Are those people just graduating with PhDs and masters for their own promotion? All is it the knowledge they are bringing, they are generating knowledge for use. And the Charles Clark has also already mentioned this, that he does not completely agree with the concept where you just uh, think and publish and do for, for just that sake. It must be perhaps for also addressing societal problems so that other people can see the value you bring on the table. Mm. We have been confronted with the issue of COVID. And there is another reflection we have to think about even now that and Professor Nawangwe mentioned about this, what the discussion that was in Makerere, it was also there in the University of Nairobi. The issue of availability of internet to our students wherever they are, to our teachers wherever they are, not only what is available in the university. We know that uh, education, to a large extent, sometimes is taken in the context of the social uh, pillar. But I would want to think about this also in terms of creating bridges. Those students were away, we were here, or we were in our homes. How do we reach them? We could only reach them through technology, through internet. To what extent has the government woken up to realize that there is need for investments mm. in this infrastructure for availability of internet. To create the bridge between the scholar or the researcher with the student, even at home, he doesn't need to travel to crowd in a classroom, the, the, the university of the future in the next 50 years. How do we use so much money to create ro roads and to create big bridges physical bridges. So there's a lot of money put in, the, in that infrastructure. But how much are we putting on the internet to create the bridges between our scholars and our students? That a thank student you, your scholars, does not need to come here. So thank you very much. I want to that I, that, that, that is the end of, of my presentation. Okay. Thank something. you, Prof. You raised some very important questions. Yes. How yes. much in, uh, investment are universities and governments uh, putting into creating um, a bridge across the um, technology divide. That has been the biggest problem. And we've seen it not just in Kenya or in East Africa, we've seen it even in the US, in other countries, where the infrastructure is still um, divided along economic lines. Um, you've also raised the issue of how do we integrate problem-based learning, experiential learning into the new modes of instruction. The question I'm now placing back to you is, how are you assessing that? You've also mentioned continuous professional development. You alluded to it in saying a lot of our instructors or professors uh, just publish for promotion, yet their teaching or their ability to engage learners has is stagnated. How are we as universities, as a regulator, demanding that our professors, our staff, continue with professional development. And I think um, uh, Charles also re, um, 
made a comment about that in his presentation. And you can see on the chat room, that comment is reiterated throughout the comments that we're seeing. How are we engaging? How is Nairobi University, Makerere, uh, Dar es Salaam, PAC engaging with uh, industry, engaging with relevant learning? How are we developing relevant learning objectives? Have we thought through our cult, uh, curriculum design? And one of the frustrations I know some of the universities have is that unfortunately some of our regulators are behind the curve. Uh, national uh, regulators are be behind the curve. I remember having to fight a war about whether books should be in the library or should they be available online. Uh, and, and our regulator at the time was demanding five copies of every book on the shelf. Yet the books were available online. So as we are coming through to the answer and question time, I would like you to reflect on your contribution to some of those comments. I would like to move to our next presenter. And our next presenter is um, mm -hmm. Professor um, Margaret uh, from Park University. And she's representing uh, a, a rather large constituent that unfortunately sometimes we overlook, and which is the private sector. Prof, uh, I was very uh, enamored by your comments that you sent earlier to me. And I won't spoil, I won't give a spoiler. So I would let you just run with it. And you have 12 minutes. Karibu Professor Margaret. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, uh, Koi. And also thank you, a lot of thanks to Reverend, no, Right Honorable Charles Clark for the presentation that he made. Thank you also IUCA community for organizing for this meeting. It's wonderful when as uh, East African region, we're able to share our thoughts and experiences and challenge one another on the way forward, especially as guided by some of the documents and some of the thinking, the strategic thinking for the East African region. So thank you very much for this. Uh, as a person representing the private universities, I'm honored to share a few thoughts. Uh, the Kenyan sector of the private universities does have a, a body that uh, enables it to convene and converge constantly, talking to one another. Even when we were going through some of the issues like COVID and on and on, conversations help us a lot to know how to support one another and navigate what we are going through, even outside COVID. That has been part of the tradition of our private universities. And I'm glad that many of the private universities um, uh, are getting stronger by the day as we engage some of the things that we come across. But today it's not so much about uh, the challenges that universities face, but I think it's really engaging these matters that have been raised by Charles Clark. And so allow me to just mention a bit of that, engage some of the things that he has mentioned, which I thought were very interesting, and then also become a storyteller because stories are part of how we engage society. Um, let me mention something. I, I am very encouraged by his approach to the conversations that he had. At no point did he look down on social sciences because many times in spaces like this, I have been surprised that society seems to lift the sciences at the expense, talk very positively of the sciences at the expense. I think society actually needs both. We need the whole round uh, 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 developments in the sciences, developments in the social sciences, because a lot of our, our, our aspirations as human are often expressed in ways that when you look at, it is very, there's a lot of affinity. To, 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 the, to the social science world. So even what he mentioned on the, the aligned ambitions, if you look at them, at, at the end of the day, it's about people, people getting better. So I found it very encouraging from the social science perspectives that uh, indeed we, we can make a contribution in terms of innovation, in terms of managing change, in terms of building people so that people can then uh, drive the futures that we're looking at. So that I want to really uh, appreciate in the presentation of, of, of uh, Honorable Charles uh, Clark. Uh, talking about high quality universities, uh, again, it's really the same thing, the psychosocial 
uh, the, 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 the issues of values. And some of us in private universities, actually quite a number of our private universities are more into uh, the social sciences and therefore the contribution to values, the things people believe, parts of the person, you know, the psychologies and on and on, are very critical in society. And so when we put our hands to the plow and work on those, it's because we believe it actually contributes significantly to what goes on in society. When people that we uh, work with and develop and be, you know, facilitate their development, so to speak, uh, uh, get that right, then at this, you, know, you, you are bound to have a society that holds together. It's like the glue that holds together. The, his comments on research I found were very interesting, and especially the challenge to get uh, our own African voice and perspectives uh, uh, part of the mainstream uh, engage, you know, conversations that go on, on in research. I think that is a very significant thing that if we can find ways that we encourage our researchers to be, not to be apologetic about the perspectives they have. Coming from social sciences, again, I find that sometimes when we're dealing with mainstream literature, uh, there's a tendency to, to brush aside the perspectives of the African persons. And so one way we have found best way to respond to this is especially at the, it's strengthening the graduate level studies graduate level studies and encouraging students to express what they think and, 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 and uh, support what they think in ways that are scientific. It really, really helps because then when we have strong graduate studies uh, uh, as, and students and research, all that goes together, then that feeds back to the way we teach in the lower levels, the, the undergraduate levels. So making, we, we can significantly make a contribution, at least in Park University, Graduate studies has become one of the main areas of our quest in growing the institution. So we've started graduate programs, master's levels and PhD levels in many of our programs so that you then develop people that are able to defend the perspectives that they see, the realities they have, that they know works and actually needs to be uh, contribute to mainstream knowledge. And then also the publishing publishing by those scholars, encouraging scholars, uh, having uh, uh, institution-based uh, uh, journals that we support, we actually finance those so that people can, 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 they are refereed journals, but they are able to publish in some of those and externally as well. So I'm just saying that bit of research and, 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 and problem solving, uh, research that engages problems in societies and things like that are very, very, very uh, uh, right on target. Uh, and, but our own graduate programs need to be strengthened in our institutions. There's one mention that he mentioned about, the, and I think several of my, my colleagues have mentioned this bit about uh, long, 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 uh, lifelong learning. This is something that some of our regulators are way behind, in, at least in our, my own country, where in our structures we had mature entry. Until not too long ago, about 10 years ago, we were told, no, it doesn't work, because something about the structures they have doesn't, doesn't allow for that. And we begged to allow it to stay in our programs until such time that we understand the place of long life, long life learning. Because we, there's a lot that people who are out there, who are not in school systems, can contribute to knowledge. But let me put a twist to this, that if we are going to appreciate that, we need also to appreciate the matter of language, how language confines us to walk in. It's as though when you have English, or allow me to say French, then you can contribute to lifelong learning in our context. And I think that is a misnomer, so something, something really wrong that we need to correct aspects of translation, allowing people to express knowledge in the language they so comfortable with and translating needs to be bigger in our region. And I'm hoping that one of these days, Park University will pioneer that. There are institutions in Africa that really pioneer that, but not outside the academia. We have it in like Bible society, for example, but in academia, we're still very shy about that, yet it holds the key. In fact, recently, uh, uh, Professor Ngugi Thiongo accepted something in Gikuyu. And he was, I mean, there's nothing wrong in that. And I think he was just making a point. It's not that he doesn't have the English. Let me come to the last before I quickly talk very, very in one minute about what we are doing in the university, but I'll combine it with this one. Uh, 
uh, Professor Clark mentioned something about international partnership and some of our colleagues have mentioned that. Indeed, even for Park University, engaging international partners have helped us in developing programs or mirroring some of our programs with what they have and not necessarily aping theirs, but you know, benefiting from what they have seen. Some of our programs have been developed in that way. And then recently, more recently, even supporting us on a dream we've had for a long time, as we saw where the future was going in terms of offering of knowledge and education, we knew we needed to go online for a long time. So we started an, our journey on online learning about 10, over 10, 15 years ago with a, one program which was very successful, we went to another program and on and on. They are accredited, they are accredited by our regulators. And then we resourced uh, significantly in terms of library, in online learning, in online material, and in terms of the, the, the platforms that we needed. And, and I must say the, international partners supported us, friends of Park University supported us on that. So when COVID arrived, we were ready to roll over. In fact, by that time, policies had been put in place to get as many members of the university, faculty and students, to be acquainted with online learning. So this is my story now. When COVID arrives, we knew exactly where we were going and how to do it. But persuading the human beings to get everybody to come on board was our task for April 2020. We spent a lot of that time. And some of the students and staff who had gone ahead to use the tools that we had, they supported us so much as champions. And so the training, the, the training of one another was in-house and it was so dynamic. It was just fantastic. To the extent that we started May on Bank, just as planned, and we have finished one trimester fully online, even doing our exams online and, and the, all the meetings, any meeting you wanted, you could do them online using the platforms that we have, using Zoom and also collaborate in using Blackboard, the, the tool, that, the, the platform that we use. I just want to say that it's, it's been encouraging to, to roll on on our, our, our to roll on, on our, uh, our, 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 what we had thought, what we had planned, and, and that we are now in the second semester moving on in online learning. So I just, uh, I, want to, I wanted to just share that story of Park University. We've learned a lot in supporting one another. We've learned a lot in uh, benchmarking from external, with external uh, uh, organizations. And some of our programs are running very, very well. Up to the PhD level, all the levels we are able to do. Let me just say this one minute, Koi, that we are still thinking through how do we do the practicums? Mm. Yeah, because that's still a challenge. I have two courses that we still must crack that. I'm told by some of the lecturers, they have managed to know how to do the practicums in psychology to a measure, but we need to still crack that. Practicals in uh, ICT, we are still cracking that. So we're still on a journey, on a learning journey as an institution. And thank you. Thank you for thank you giving so me the opportunity. Thank you, Margaret. You have a very mm. compelling story. Um, you've mentioned a couple of things that I'd like to just bring uh, back to the conversation. You spoke about um, language and the confines of language. And again, I want to take that back to uh, Clark, and I hope you'll be able to comment on this. Um, African ways of knowing and African ways of telling. Um, a lot of our institutions are still colonial in their perspective of what knowledge is and how it is generated. So how do we combat intellectual imperialism? You've also spoken about your partnerships with inter international bodies. And uh, what I like about that, Professor Margaret, is that if a PAC student is working with a scholar from another institution and they're jointly working on a research project, that other scholar has to recognize the African voice and the African perspective. And in publishing together jointly, then that would give visibility to the African voice and the African ways of knowing. So thank you very much for that. You also have talked about uh, the fact that PAC University has had a continuous change process happening. So that when a challenge came, it was not hard to lean on your champions. So I think that was very important. And uh, Clark Charles also mentioned that, how do we integrate changes of uh, processes of change into our cultures as institutions? Now, I want to go back to our... Yeah. 
You're muted, Koi. You're muted. Goodness. I've been muted all this time. No, just just no. just up. Okay. One um so I'd like to pull in our, our last uh, panelist, and I would like to remind all of you that we did start half an hour into when we wanted to. So I would like to ask for your all indulgence to give us at least a half hour for your questions and responses. Um, I would like to ask uh, Professor Alexandra Liabaje um, to make some comments if he's online. Prof? Yeah, thank you. Professor, uh, I would like first to thank Prof. Mike for organizing this webinar and inviting me to be part of this webinar. And uh, I would like to thank the Right Honorable Charles for his uh, great presentations and also colleagues uh, who shared the ideas uh, before me. Um, here we are talking about reshaping higher education in East Africa uh, in line with uh, East African Community Vision 2050. It is uh, a vision that has economic aspirations, political aspirations, and social aspirations. But at that level, I already ask uh, myself a question. Uh, the vision is not for leaders, the vision is for citizens. How many of us, how many of East African community citizens are knowledgeable about this vision? And how many of us took time to strategize uh, about our contribution to make this vision 2050 happen? So uh, most of the time we see countries, regions, develop, uh, even the continent developing uh, visions, but uh, there is an effort that has to be made to sell that vision to partners, to stakeholders, not only to international organizations and bodies so that we could be in a position to implement it ourselves as stakeholders. A number of concerns uh, were identified in the process of the development of this vision 2050. One was uh, persistent poverty. The second one was uh, inadequate social cohesion. A third one was lack of human capital. There is increasing unemployment, especially among the youth and uh, low levels of uh, industrialization and lack of competitiveness. I just mentioned a few of them, not all of them. And this vision provided a number of uh, uh, approaches that would lead to the, act to the activities, to the initiatives, so that we could get rid of that poverty, we could be responding to the needs of our population. So they identified five, six pillars in this vision, including infrastructure, industrialization, agriculture, agriculture and so on. And uh, education was seen as the first enabler for uh, the realization of this vision. So this is where we are if you talk about education, in particular higher education, because education is responsible for capacity development for the entire community in order to create well-educated people who will put in place all the strategies that are developed. And when you look at the targets, I was looking at the targets for education, the vision, Unfortunately, I couldn't find statistics for higher education. And uh, this is probably informed by the fact that we do not have accurate data for higher education. And fortunately, Inter-University Council for East Africa started the development of higher education management information system so that we could be able to see where we are today 
and then put a target for 2050. For the time being, in the vision, there is no a target, not a single one, no a single indicator for higher education. However, there are quite good uh, number of uh, activities or initiatives that are supposed to take place between now and 2050. One of them is the development of uh, human capital through enhancement of teacher training at all levels. That will inform the quality of higher education. The development of a curriculum on sustainability, development of training programs that prepare students for careers in fields related to envisaged industrialization, effective use of ICT to enhance learning outcomes, and also there is a target on systems of, of education to establish linkages between tertiary, vocational, and secondary primary and the early childhood education. There is a target to harmonize education systems to facilitate mutual recognition of uh, the qualifications. There is also a target for skills for emerging development initiatives, capacity building tailored both to present and anticipated future markets needs or markets demands. So this is in the vision 2050 clearly mentioned and uh, the same vision identified a number of centers of excellence to be established. A number of universities and institutions in East Africa are earmarked to be transformed into centers of excellence in that vision. Lastly, there is also a need to develop specific skills in line with the pillars, the five or the six pillars of the vision. What I couldn't find if we are to create jobs for the youth is the importance of a sports industry and the importance of culture industry. Uh, Prof. Margaret touched at it a little bit. When you look at uh, worldwide industries, these are two areas that merit also to be taken into consideration in the near future. And uh, all this can be achieved only if we have East African citizens. How do we make sure that we become East African citizens, not Kenyan citizen, not Ugandan citizen, not Rwandan citizen? Uh, there is, in our view, as IUSEA and uh, higher learning institutions, a role to play to put in place a center of excellence where we could promote values of being East African, a center for regional integration in East Africa. I'd like to uh, end my intervention by mentioning a few things. One is the mandate given to higher learning institutions in this vision 2050 and the mandate given to Inter-University Council in this vision 2050. So that we be aware of it and we see how we can achieve it if this vision is to be achieved by that target, by that date. The role of education institutions, in particular universities, is to mainstream research and innovation for socioeconomic transformation. How are we prepared? A number of uh, speakers before me have uh, elaborated a little bit more on that. And uh, this is enshrined in our ESC Vision 2050. The role of IUSEA is to promote good practices in the management of higher education institutions. It is unfortunate that uh, we were not able to launch uh, the Higher Education Leadership Program 
of East African community uh, this year because of COVID-19. But this is one of the mandate given to Arisea by the East African community, by our leaders at government level and at regional level. The second one is to coordinate the development of higher education and research in the community. How is Arisea going to achieve this? There is a number of uh, approaches that need to be explored. The first one is to see how we could review the financing model of universities. Studies have been done in the past, back in 2015. I think they need to be reviewed so that the financing model of universities be aligned with uh, these priorities to cater for research, innovation, and development. There is a need, as mentioned by a number of our colleagues, to reach out to industry in order to enhance research and development departments back home in our private sector industries and businesses. And that this can be done in a partnership with the East African Business Council. They are very much interested to collaborate with the uh, Inter-University Council for East Africa and universities. And we hope that this partnership could be extended to private sector uh, chambers at country levels so that we could enhance research and development involving both academia and private people. Lastly, there is a need to enhance collaboration between universities and established research institutions in partner states. We have research institutions in agriculture, in energy, in different sectors, but we work in isolation, universities on one side, research institutions on another side. So we need to look at how best we can coordinate activities of research institutions and universities at country level and at regional level. ISTECO can also play a role and they work hand in hand with Inter-University Council for East Africa. Let me end by uh, uh, emphasizing what Professor Kiyama said, uh, that is how do we create a innovative culture in our universities, in our industries, in our respective communities. And all this will be achieved if we really become East African community citizens. I thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. It's really good to see you. Face, I haven't seen you in a long time. Um, thank you for your good comments. Um, I'd like to give an opportunity to Charles to respond to some of the comments our panelists have made. In the process, there's still some really good uh, conversation in our chat room. Um, we have uh, people asking, Professor Kiyama, I think, uh, please note this for your last comments, your one minute at the end. Um, how do we transform the mindset of our lecturers to be more engaging? And I think Professor Margaret's team uh, partly answers that. Um, having a, a continuous assessment change going on in the institution. But what is the view from Nairobi University? Um, you also mentioned something, Prof. Um, we need to become uh, East African citizens. And this has been one of the frustrations that I've been having, especially even now that my children are in university. I keep asking them, why are you talking like an Australian or an American? Why can't you talk like an intellectual Kenyan? Do we have what, have we defined the profile of what an intellectual East African looks like, thinks like, implements like? And I think what you're talking about is driving us towards that. What makes us quintessentially East African academics? Um, I also wanted to mention one of the questions that um, came through on the chat uh, is, the, is the issue of uh, regulators. Are the regulators on point? We seem to be pushing. We seem to know what we want to do in policy, in, but we are, why are we not executing? Why are we not changing our curriculum design? Why are we not changing our ability to move from lecturers to facilitators? What are the things that are stopping us? How is a regulator either confining us or enabling us to actually move into reshaping 
higher education in East Africa. So I'd like to give an opportunity to Charles. Um, I'll give you three minutes to just make mention on what you he have heard back from the panelists, and then we'll go to the question and answer time. I would like to encourage all the panelists to click on your chat button at the bottom of your page, review some of the questions that are being asked, and pick one or two that are relevant to you. If not, I can be able to direct the questions to you. Charles? Boy, thank you very much. I'll uh, be, try and be very brief. Uh, firstly, thanks for all the responses. I really appreciated them, and thanks to the people in the chat rooms. As you rightly said a second ago, there's a whole string of very important points that have been made. I'll just go through them quickly. Firstly, that range of issues around imposter syndrome, colonial system of education, intellectual imperialism. Uh, this is a very big point. Um, and it's why I emphasised the question of Africa in my first research slide. I think the only answer to that is for Africa to develop its own interpretation, its own explanation, its own values in that system. It won't be enough simply to criticise the way the American systems, the British systems, whatever happens. The criticisms can be made, but the core point is actually it relates to the point you made at the end there, Coy, self-confidence in what Africa has to offer both for Africa and for the world. And that requires thinking about, as many people have said, but it's not enough just to try and tear down the rest. Second, I thought the storyteller's language point was very important and very positive. It is a contribution and it is, is very important. And as Margaret said, the role of the social, social sciences and humanities are very important. Sometimes people focus on the STEM subjects and fine, they're very important, but actually, the way our societies will evolve to the changing world is in the way that people respond to this situation. And that is through understanding people's behavior, social sciences, humanities, the language we use, as you said, Margaret, uh, taking the storyteller history. So I agree with all of that. Women and youth being involved as change agents, I think it's just very important. And the only thing to say is by encouraging women and young people to be actively involved, take responsibility, <laughs> Level. The question is asked about how the employers become sources of resources and the answer is first by paying for students to go to university and contributing to universities to educate in areas of interest to the employers and secondly by co-funding research. On graduate unemployment I'm always a bit sceptical about the phrase. Uh, it goes back to a planning model of uh, education universities, which uh, a manpower planning approach, which I don't think is really correct. Uh, I think the question that is raised to me by graduate unemployment is, are the courses which the university is teaching best suited to the uh, economy in which graduates are emerging, rather than the other way around, are the graduates suited to those, those things? I think it raises the question for universities about the kind of courses they're doing. Coy, your point about regulators and related to that is the faculty being behind the curve in terms of change, as uh, the Vice Chancellor mentioned, in particular in relation to online learning. The fact is, large numbers of people are behind the curve. They're looking at a vision of universities which is historic rather than a vision of universities which is future looking. The solution to that lies in the universities themselves saying and articulating very strongly the future version of universities, which means future-minded faculty and future-minded regulators, and universities need to press for that. Flexibility, I won't dwell on. It's a very core point, which everybody acknowledges, very easy to say, very difficult to do. But the final response I'd make is a lot of people have commented positively on the points about partnerships of a variety of different types, and that seems to me absolutely central. If universities live in their ivory towers and don't partner, they won't be able to adapt to the future. If they do partner, whether it's with uh, employers' organisations, whether it's with international collaborators, whether it's with governments, then you can see ways to the future. Thank you. I tried to respond quickly to the points, I, but I very much appreciate both the comments made from the panel and the comments made in the chat. All right. Uh, question time. I think, uh, Professor Kiyama, you have that first question about lecturers. Would you like to tackle that while I just call, um, re, uh, summarize the rest of the questions? Yes, I can. Thank you. I can tackle that one very quickly. Uh, I think the, we have had a problem for some time 
because of the way the lecturers and the professors have been underpaid by governments and not taken care of for over time, but uh, things started changing somehow, but we are not yet, yet there. So to some extent, the lecturers casualized uh, the, the teaching. And they took teaching as just something you do in addition to many other things you do to make money. And as a result, therefore, going to the, this problem-based learning means that you have to put slightly more thought process into it and plan appropriately so that the, the interaction with the student is more productive. But they will prefer to pick the notes where they were and then come and read them to the student. Or those PowerPoint they pick from Wikipedia and they come and they read them to students. So they need to be retooling uh, for the lecturers and also to ensure that everybody gives to the university the 40 hours that you are supposed to give in a week, not the two hours you come and you are coming from somewhere to come and they, and they need notes. So that's it's really also in the context of display of the lecturers. So even the young people who have been trained, they have also taken over to that kind of mode of teaching as a casual, as it is a, a part-time thing. The main thing is the other things you do, consultancies and the other activities you do. We need to, if you choose an academic life, then we must uh, work uh, to ensure that you give the best that you have. The university scholars are actually restless people. And the minute you see that there is no adrenaline, there is no restlessness, then you know that the university is definitely dying. I, when I, where I was mentored, mentored, I know that the, the, the professor, before giving the class, would not allow any other disruption. He would prepare to ensure that that class is the best. But now you come from another place, you enter into a class. So that is where the problem is. So there is a bit of retooling, a, a bit of re, uh, working, uh, to change the culture to return to the university where they should be, all of us, not to casualize teaching and uh, to take it as a side thing. So that's, uh, that's how I look at it in terms of changing the mindset. You continue to talk and engage the lecturers. And those Thank who cannot work that way, then they need to drop off so that we have those who can, who can be retooled. Thank you. And, and I think this is very reflective, Prof, of the flip in um, even our teachers at the basic level. Most, when, when I went to school, I think, which is not that, that long ago, but anyway. <laughs> when, when I went to school, teachers were still the best. I mean, you, you were the best and then you became a teacher. Somewhere along the line, we got the mediocre people are now becoming the teachers. So we need to rethink the model of teaching and replace value on the teachers and therefore the lecturers and therefore the content that they're giving. Some of the questions that I've been seeing on the chat is how then if we are demanding better, teach, better teaching and learning, how do we reward those who are encouraging and engaging with their learners? So do we shift the weights of promotion? Do we develop centers of excellence around learning as opposed to teaching? Um, so that, those are some of the comments that I see coming up. And, and I think one of the other things that has been really interesting in the conversation we're having is what is the role of career development, purpose discovery um, in our teaching of students in uh, exposing our students. Because I believe personally that if somebody has a purpose, it doesn't matter what career they're in. They will, the, their purpose will drive them. Professor Margaret, what are you doing at your institution to embed or encourage discovery of purpose for your students and also for your faculty? What is their purpose in where they are? And, and in, think about that in reshaping our education system, how would we then embed purpose in that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Coy. That's quite a question. Um, at Park University, how do we embed this quest for purpose by individuals? Um, I think it's in the way you want teachers. If the teaching shifts from lecturing to facilitation, that actually fast tracks the quest of individuals uh, finding their purpose because then they begin to excel. Individuals excel when they realize they can do things that initially were done by the lecturer. And I, I say this because when you teach online, 
there's much that the student does. They do much of the reading, they do much of the exploring in the library, and that alone uh, makes a student uh, explore beyond what we would normally do in the traditional classroom. And, and then as they explore, they are shaping their mind. They're shaping to know what they want to do, what they want to think, and, and, and that, that kind of thing. And I've, I found that uh, as, as we've, if we engage online learning, the role of the lecturer actually becomes a facilitator. You, you, you meet them at their point of need, you talk to them. In, in some of our classes, they actually wrote in quite a number of these past time, they said they don't want a, a collaborative class. Every collaborative is where we see them face to face like in Zoom now. They don't want it every two, every one week. They want it every two weeks. In between, they'd like just to explore the library and, and they are responding to the discussion questions. They are discussing to, the, to the, 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 the reflections that they have on the topics that they have and do, doing presentations. Those help them to ex, uh, explore who they are. So I think it is significantly changing the mode of how we teach and knowing the value in another way of teaching. And I find online learning very, very uh, powerful in that. Let me say something also on examination. Because there's a lot of work that the student is doing in between when they start and end the trimester, there's a lot of work. So Park University, we had to flip the issue of marks and uh, value that we place to the evaluation. In other words, evaluation had to be spinned on its head. What then is evaluation? So things like, for example, the students attending class is important. They come to class on time and on, on those ethics of life, coming on time, presenting, and things like that. We also spin it in a way that traditionally it used to be 30% continuous assessment, 70% exams. In our policies now and our practice, for all the students who are taking, all the students, it is 60% continuous assessment and 40% exams. And then what kind of exams? It's a higher level kind of questions that do not reflect rote memory, but rather reflection. How do you apply this and things like that? And then also the 60%, how do we arrive at that? And I'm saying this because it, it builds on your question. How do you develop people getting uh, an self image that is very positive? Th things like they are pre at uh, presentations in class, uh, they are way of responding to the DQs, uh, the discussion questions, and their way of interacting with the other students. They, react, they actually react to the other students' comments. So it's a whole interactive space that builds the image and the self-worth of an individual. And therefore, they are able to discover their purpose. Thank you. That's really good. And I think that also addresses the issue that Professor Alexandra was bringing about. The, their individual confidence will then create citizens who are able to set, step up, have a clear purpose, have a clear agenda for their lives. I'd like to send the next question. There was a question on um, uh, basic skills, how, basic CBC. How are we are we ready for competency-based education in higher education? Kenya has already moved to that model for basic education, yet we are still graduating um, Bachelor of Education students today who have no training in competency-based, how to have competency-based education classrooms. So are we ready and what are your universities doing moving towards skill-based and competency-based? Um, DVC from Tanzania, what are you doing in Tanzania or at the University of Dar es Salaam? And I would also like uh, uh, Professor Kuria, Dr. Kuria to mention, what is the role then of Inter-University Council of East Africa to move us towards reshaping East African higher education sector towards competencies and based? But um, Prof from uh, Dar es Salaam, Ritinwa, are you on? No? All right. Um, who there, have I not got? Oh. We can just unmute. Ritinwa, you're on? I think it's Mike. Yeah. Hello? Yes, excellent. Thank you. Yes, what are we doing about moving towards competence based curriculum? Uh, our current five-year rolling strategic plan 2019-2020-2024 enjoins the university to review all its curricula to move towards problem and student-based learning. 
I believe this is, these are cognitive concepts. In so doing, by moving towards problems, it means students will actually be learning while addressing real problems. Also, by going towards uh, student-centered learning, we shall be building their confidence and therefore building also East African citizens up, as we have been joined by, enjoyed by Professor uh, Jan Bajel. You earlier on asked me two questions, how we're addressing the question of relevance and how we are addressing diversity. I think this is the time I should address them. We, the University of Islam, since the inception, we have always been guided by relevance, not just to the problems or the needs, but also the opportunities. Uh, when we started in 1961, the problem we, we faced was lack of uh, personnel to serve primarily in the public sector. And therefore, the Universities Act 1970, Section 4, uh, entrusted the University of Islam with the responsibility to produce qualified personnel for the public services. 1990, when the system changed in Tanzania, moved from a socialist centrally planned economy to a market economy, we overhauled all our curricula to be able to train also for the private sector. Current revision 2061 commits us to produce students for the, glo the, the global citizens, a global student, basically those who can compete with the rest in an internationalized and globalized world. How do we achieve that? The way we ensure relevance is through tracer studies. The Tanzania Commission for Universities uh, guidelines and standards require each and every university to conduct tracer studies regularly, but it does not set time frames or periods. But our, the University of Islam quality assurance policy requires the university to conduct tracer studies after every five years. And this year we have just embarked on the next cycle of tracer studies. So relevance is at the top of our priority. With regard to enhancing diversity, this is one of the objectives which the University of Islam pursues vigorously. Uh, when the University of Islam started in 1961, it had 14 law students, all of them male except one female. And until 20 years ago, the number, the, the percentage of female students was barely 25. But today, the percentage of female students is 44% across the university. But also the university is taking deliberate and concrete steps to enhance gender balance within its staff. For example, with the effect from this year, every year the university will be organizing um, publication retreats or writing retreat for female scholars in order to, to, to enable them to gain adequate uh, publications for promotions. Earlier on, I mentioned that the university has established a, mer a university of the same merit scholarships. Those scholarships, 50% must go to female as a rule. So we are moving on. We are recording successes, and in fact, some of the successes have been so huge, for example, in the School of Law, where I belong, currently 75% of the students are female. So male, male lawyers in Tanzania may become an endangered species very soon as a result of the deliberate steps. So thank you very much. If there's another question, I'll be glad to address it. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Someone. Yes. Can, I am. Can uh, you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. And I'm done. And I thank you very much for this opportunity to respond to the questions. Me? There was a little bit of a disconnection. Can you? Uh, okay. Uh, hello. Thank you very much. Um, I think. Um. End of our time, um, but I would like to see, see if there's. I think we've covered all our panelists. Um, some of the conversations that are ongoing are about um, effective uh, e-learning, uh, the ICT divide, and how we can bridge that, and also the issues of um, regulation and improvement and speedy. Uh, uptake of new technologies and new ways of learning and knowing. 
Um, before I hand back over to uh, Dr. Kuria, I would like to acknowledge all the people who have been on the chats. Uh, we have representation from Clark University in Uganda, from Kenyatta University in Kenya, Dedan Kemavi University, Ministry of Education in Tanzania, Uganda Martyrs, like Kipia University, the East Africa Commission, Morogoro University, uh, University of Agriculture, Meru National Polytechnic, um, Barara, East uh, Africa Rural University, Makerere, Nairobi University, Park University, Mbale University, Ritz University in South Africa. We all search and see Bila. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, I would like to say it's been my moderate conversation. It's been a good one. And I would like to now turn back to um, uh, Buana Curia because I think on my end, the internet is becoming a bit problematic. Thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing all of you again at the next conference. Mike, Q Curia, are you on? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, the question about regulators is still to you, sir. <laughs> uh, first of all, you asked a very direct question. Before we get to that, I would like to address that question a little bit earlier. You asked what is IUCA doing, especially with reference to the idea of competence-based learning. Um, and I would like to just offer two um, points. Number one, some of you might be aware that we now have something that we call the East African Quality Assurance Network Forum. This was birthed by IUCEA. This uh, organization meets every year at least once. Unfortunately, this year, they were not able to do so because of COVID. Probably we are going to think about how to make sure they meet anyway, now that we have platforms such as this. Um, but some of the topics that they have dealt with in the past and they, that they focus on with, with reference to competence-based learning, the question of active learning, the use of uh, ICT and technologies. These topics have been covered in this particular teams. But as uh, many of the speakers here mentioned, this is one of the most difficult things to transform the culture and thinking of faculty in places. So we don't see it as a one-stop something that's going to end. And it is for this reason that I go to the next point that we are doing. Um, what we want to do is uh, to develop uh, like online uh, learning platform for people to learn on how to do competence-based teaching and learning. And the idea is that uh, we are going to have modules developed at a regional level then we are going to have experts trained at the regional level. And at IUCA, we are going to uh, establish the platform, which means if a university wants their staff members to learn how to do, to use technology, to use uh, computer-based learning, they can request for that and we will facilitate. So we don't have to build these little teams in all the universities in the region. Mm -hmm. We have one in the, at, the, at the council. And all you do is just tell us, that uh, we need this kind of training and these other people. We establish the class for you, we give you the facilitators and it, it goes on. And at the end, maybe that connects now to the next question that you mentioned about the regulators. I have to uh, inform members here that uh, we are very lucky in the sense that we have regular meetings with all the regulators from all the partner states. In fact, they are members of two committees of ours. One of them is quality assurance and the other one is common high education area. So the ideas that you raise here uh, will be discussed by them, with them. And we have discussed this uh, actually. And I must say that uh, the crop of leaders that we have in the National Commission and Councils now are thinking a little bit differently. And they're willing actually to rethink that idea of uh, how, how many pieces, how many acres of land do you have? How many physical books do you have? I think those issues are easy, becoming dented and they're willing to see that alternative. And so our responsibility is to engage them and engage them and make sure that that happens uh, in, in the very end. So this is what uh, we are doing at, at, at a regional level. So I believe I have now uh, handled the two questions that you asked with reference to, co to competence-based learning and also the regulators. Uh, now, just to close, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like first of all to just take this opportunity to thank you very much. 
this kind of a forum is not the kind of thing that you have every other day. And to have um, the kind of speakers that we have had today, uh, it's not something that happens every other time. So on behalf of the Inter-University Council for East Africa, I want to take the opportunity to thank every one of you. Charles Clark, thank you very much, all the way from the UK. Professor Gitahi from the University of Nairobi, thank you very much. Professor Banas Nawangwe from uh, Makerere University, thank you very much. Bonaventure, thank you very much for coming. Professor Lembabaje joining us again all the way from Kigali, thank you very much. We really appreciate the continued support. Uh, Professor Koi, thank you very much for uh, uh, facilitating this forum so well. We thank you indeed. And the, lastly, I would like to say that I, we, we are picking all the points. There was actually someone who is uh, compiling all the comments that you have made, all the contributions you have made, we'll have that report. And we want to make sure that this isn't a talk shop. We'll take those ideas, we'll think about them, and we'll translate them into the strategic plan. And we hope that then will be translated into some of the uh, implementations in the university level. Uh, because as we have mentioned, we want our universities to impact the communities in which they live. I think the question that Professor Gitai asked are very critical. If the university was closed, who would care? Who would feel it? And we want to move to that place where people say, you cannot touch the universities, they need them. They are affecting us. And uh, this is the direction we'd like to go. And for that reason, we are going to study the contribution that has come from this uh, forum very, very keenly. But if you don't mind, I'll just mention about one or, one or two that I found very critical uh, in the contributions. The first one was with reference to question of uh, mobilizing uh, resources for research, both from the public and the private sector locally, instead of just looking outward all the time. I think that is something that we really have to think, uh, put our heads together and see the ways in which we can support. And that I think can contribute to the whole process of the decolonization of the African higher education. When, if we continue saying our system is so colonized, but we are not willing to support the ideas that are coming from locally, we have a problem. And I think we need to set our mind to that. Number two is that uh, we continue to explore more uh, opportunities for partnership between the universities in the region. And one specific one mentioned was the idea of joint programs, especially at postgraduate level between universities. I know it is happening in some of the areas of the field. I'm aware, for example, we did establish a center we are calling Center for Mathematics. And that is uh, being done regionally by universities in different places. And maybe such, more such opportunities will need to come up. Number three is to look at the ways in which we can make the universities have more impact in the communities that they live. Number four, to see how we make sure that we can effect a cultural shift um, in the minds uh, of our staff members in line with the changing times. So that questions of admission, questions of testing, I mean, um, uh, evaluation, questions of uh, uh, research, questions of uh, teaching and learning can be addressed in line with changing times. Um, number five, the ways in which we are going to make sure that the African voice is heard in, on the global stage in terms of research knowledge, and knowledge production. Uh, we have to find a way of making sure that that is heard. And um, number six, there was a question of this vision we are talking about 2050. How do we make sure that the citizens of the East African community understand it and that they buy the idea and that they are willing to support it? And I think that needs to happen not just at the common person's level, but even also at the government level, because then that will also follow up the issue of funding. What kind of uh, activities are our government willing to fund in support of this uh, 2050? And we are saying universities have a responsibility to make sure that that uh, happens. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is to ensure that the question of arts, humanities, and social sciences are not relegated to the back burner, but we see the ways in which they can contribute to a more robust East African community. I know that there are many other ideas that came up, and we'll be looking at them. This is just a summary, but I want to thank you very much and assure you that we'll be looking forward to inviting you again. I hope one of these days we can actually have a face-to-face -face meeting as well so that we can see and integrate a little bit better. Otherwise, thank you very much and do have a good day. Thank you too for organizing.
Good day Thank to you everybody. very much.